are in Hastings now in East Sussex down on the coast and I had no idea what to expect from Hastings other than perhaps a bit of history and the houses here are so unusual I guess you would call them terraced homes we would probably call them townhomes in the states or walk-ups but they're like four stories tall and very narrow kind of remind me of the townhomes in San Francisco except taller <laughs> these houses here in Hastings are so unusual they're really tall and really colorful Another thing that's reminiscent of San Francisco is all the bay windows. And another thing that's reminiscent of San Francisco is all of the steep, hilly streets. And another thing that's reminiscent of San Francisco is that it's near the water and it's rainy and foggy. Well, we decided we couldn't be this close to Hastings without coming here, so here we are, but the weather is rubbish for the first time on this trip. But we're not gonna let the rain stop us from checking out Hastings. A lot of these houses are very colorful and some are especially colorful. I don't know if it'll show up on camera, but this is a very hilly place. I think we're on Mount Pleasant right now. Alexandra Park is the largest formal park in Hastings. It's famed for its arboretum, which claims to have one of the best collections of trees in Britain. But to be honest, I know a few other places in Britain which might want to dispute that claim. The large ponds in the park used to supply fresh water to the residents of Hastings during Victorian times. Next, we explore the Old Town, which has some lovely half-timber buildings and very old cars. What model is this lovely vehicle? Behind the car is the Shovel House, which is a 15th century house where Sir Cloudsley Shovel's mother lived. Admiral Shovel had the fabulous first name of Cloudsley and was a famous naval officer, originally from Norfolk. In the late 1600s, King William III was told that Shovel was the best officer of his age. After valiantly fighting in many battles at sea, in 1707, at age 56, he was involved in a tragic shipwreck one stormy night in the rocky area around the Scilly Isles. Three ships sank and over 1,300 men died. It was one of the worst tragedies of the Royal Navy. Everyone in Shovel's flagship, the Association, perished. Shovel was buried in Westminster Abbey. This place is called Donkey Cottage. You might think it's because of the donkeys on their windowsill, but actually it's because only donkeys will fit through the doors. Both of the doors to this place are incredibly low. We've got the seaside town fun of amusement park rides and arcades and churros and snack bar stands. You can see a little bit of this deep cliff face behind the gift shops and whatnot here on the seaside. Ah, that's the castle up on top of that cliff. Hastings Castle is a ruin but still very worth coming to visit because of the history associated with it. It's perched looking over the sea. So you can imagine the importance of its placement for defense and fortification. This image shows where the cliff edge would have been in 1060. So you can see how much it has receded in the interim and therefore where the original castle walls would have been. People have been living here on the Castle Hill for thousands of years. Flint tools from the Mesolithic period around 600 BC are among the earliest finds here in Hastings. 
but what this place is really known for is 1066, when William sailed with his invasion force to England in September. They carried with them a prefabricated wooden fort which was erected here at Hastings. Following the battle on the 14th of October, 1066, one of William's first orders was that the castle at Hastings should be rebuilt in stone. This mysterious little passage at first was thought to be a sally port, a quick way out for a surprise attack on invaders. But current experts now believe that the passage is more likely to have led to the toilet. This tower was believed to be part of the church. This was the high altar and the nave of the church. The Chapel of the Holy Cross, reputed to be a place of miracles. This is the central tower, which once housed a set of bells and has a spiral staircase that was only discovered in 1824. In 1066, William of Normandy invaded England, bringing his army, horses, and provisions. Most experts believe that William set up camp on the West Hill and fortified the site before setting off to fight and win the Battle of Hastings. William became King of England, and in about 1069, he gave the newly formed castle into the keeping of his trusted commander, the Count of Eu. Hastings had a fine harbor at the time and was a very important port. It was also a main route to and from Normandy. Later, the castle was rebuilt in stone, and during the next two centuries, a number of alterations and improvements were made. The kings of England, William Rufus, Stephen, John, and Edward I all stayed here. This site was only excavated and turned into a popular tourist attraction in 1824. This was the East Gate. And you can still see the grooves in the stone where the portcullis was. Up here is where the Mott was. Though it's gone now, Hastings claims to have had the first Mott and Bailey castle in England, based on what we know about the castle from the Bayeu Tapestry. Well, I was hoping to go visit Battle Abbey now, which is the site of where the Battle of Hastings took place, but we've run out of time. So sadly, all I can share with you is this quick little clip of a video I took while we were driving through Battle and went around the roundabout, which had a nice little monument to the Battle of Hastings in the middle of the roundabout. Here we are driving into Battle now. We don't have time to stop, but Ian is at least allowing me a drive-by peek at Battle Abbey. So that's your look at the front of the Abbey. Ian is so good to me. I'm spoiled rotten. This is a quick video clip of driving through the town of Battle. It's Sunday afternoon. We are very hungry and we are racing to make our booking on time for a Sunday dinner. Ian found an interesting place in nearby Mayfield which had great reviews. So we are driving there now. We have come to Mayfield for a Sunday roast dinner, and here's where we're having it. Middle House Mayfield is a pub free house from 1575. Absolutely beautiful and delicious food. You gotta love a pub with a nice fireplace and comfy furniture. This is my very fancy nut roast with a Yorkshire pudding and Ian's very fancy pork belly and with a cracklin <laughs> shard in it and all of our vegetables and a chocolate lava cake for dessert. Okay, Ian, break into that thing. Let's, let's see the molten chocolate lava. Oh yeah. 
Yep, 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 yep. That looks good. That's the business right there. This pub has a massive back garden and lovely views of the countryside. There's a lot going on in this village crest sign. There's like a girl and flowers and children around her feet. Underneath it, we have a devil playing tug of war with a monk. I don't know what's going on. So many pretty 15th century buildings around here. This place is called Old Cottage, fittingly, and it's really kind of wonky and crooked. This is the parish church of St. Dunstan's, and it's Sunday, so I'm hoping we can look inside. Ian was just pointing out how that type of steeple, we don't see it in Gloucestershire, but it's got the top part of the hat, <laughs> the witch's hat, is one slope, and then the bottom part is another slope. St. Dunstan's was founded in 960 by St. Dunstan, who was then Archbishop of Canterbury. It was originally a log church, which lasted until the 12th century when it was replaced by the Normans with a stone structure. The church, as it stands today, was built between 1410 and 1420, with later additional work carried out during the reign of Henry VIII. This church was virtually destroyed by fire. Only the tower the lancet window in the west wall and the base of the north aisle survive to this day. This font is from 1666, which we all know I'm rubbish at history, but I do think that's when the London fire happened. So a few things strike me when I first walk in this church. One is there's kind of the stone columns, but then up above it, you see all that exposed stone, which... I don't see very often, but it's really beautiful. And then the other thing is that there's a high ceiling with beautiful wooden beams. And then this woodwork in the corners is just lovely. It's a beautiful frame to the altar area. This stained glass window above the altar is just magnificent. Really beautifully done. Looking at the ceiling of this church, I remember a story I was told about master woodworkers who were shipbuilders, and then they used the same building techniques and methods to construct the ceiling of a church. And that's what this looks like, is the inside of a ship. The nave has four tomb slabs of Sussex iron. The best preserved is this one of Thomas Sands, who was a wine cooper from London and died in 1708. Because they are made of iron, these are so well preserved versus the usual memorial slabs made of stone, which get worn away by thousands of visitors walking on them. There is another tomb here for a Thomas Sands who died in 1668. It's fascinating to see the spelling and also how the letter N is backwards as well as the number seven. Speaking of monuments, I'm obsessed with these tombs of lords and ladies in this style. They are shown kneeling in prayer with their children depicted as kneeling figures below them. And I think the skulls represent children who were stillborn or died in infancy. I see these types of tombs all over Britain. fun walking down a little alleyway like this and then seeing the countryside off in the distance above the old homes. We love the village of Mayfield and uh, well when we were in the village center we saw this sign that had a map of the area and various landmarks and things. So we went and checked out the church, we walked up and down the high street, it was all good. And then on the map there was this illustration of a windmill. And I had seen a few windmills here around Kent, but I hadn't been able to film any yet. So I said to Ian, let's go find this windmill. That would be so cool to take a picture or a little video of it. So 
Ian being the supportive, obliging husband that he is, drives me up to this windmill, which you could put in the sat nav and navigate directly to. But then I get there <laughs> and there's all these signs on the driveway saying private, private. And then you can look up and see bits of the windmill, but you can also see these giant private property signs all around the windmill. So obviously I did not walk beyond those gates. Um, also next to the gates was a rather menacing sign about Dr. Evil's secret lair. So yeah, <laughs> getting to see the windmill up close and personal was not going to happen. I don't think they should be uh, publicizing that windmill on the sign in the village center, if you ask me. I hope you enjoyed this video of our time in the Weald. Next, why don't you check out one of these other videos of adventures we've had in the area. Thanks so much for watching and do something good in the world today.